Obi-Wan Kenobi is the quintessential masculine submissive, if that makes sense, right? Because Obi-Wan Kenobi is not an individual who is particularly spiritual and he and because he's not particularly spiritual and he doesn't particularly do things just because he enjoys it but he also doesn't seek to be in control he's a very structured individual he's a very disciplined and calculated individual not necessarily calculated because there's a difference between being calculated and being disciplined and being structured obi-wan kenobi finds his safety in his structure and oftentimes, outside of specific context, you won't see the issues that come about from being masculine submissive because masculine submissiveness is something that more so thrives in a strong, structured, stable society or a community or some type of structure, right? Especially if that structure is a well-oiled machine, masculine submissiveness can work well. Just like if we're talking about dating and relationships, you know, traditional dating, traditional marriage, tradition is kind of predicated on the idea of masculine submissiveness because you are taking a logical mindset to say that you need to give up control. But the issue with masculine submissiveness is when there is overstimulation in the mist, something truly spiritual or something beneath the surface that's in the mist, when there is something that's like overstimulation, like sexually or emotionally, whatever it is, it's something that can catch the masculine submissive off guard. They're often susceptible to being manipulated by feminine dominance because that is what they're often going to be more so uh, compatible with. Right. When we're talking about just on a polarity level, not necessarily on who they think they'll get along with, but who they'll actually be in the presence of and, and get along with someone on that level. Now, there are specific things that come about with masculine submissives that a lot of people may not quite catch on to that were very big aspects and very minor, very subtle aspects of Obi-Wan Kenobi's personality. So one of those things is passive aggressiveness, right? When you are in a position of not being in control of it, what exactly you're doing, but being in that position from a logical perspective, you're not used to a subtle change but you're also not able to just go ahead and change your circumstances and when you're unable to change your circumstances nor unwilling to be fluid to giving up control to the scenario that you're in when things go outside of your your spectrum then it can tend to create passive aggressiveness so passive aggressiveness can be seen throughout the life of Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and just that frustration he would experience in times where you know he was up under Qui-Gon Jinn and you know he, he was learning things but he didn't really like what he was learning right uh there's times where he was upset because he was a 17 year old padawan and he would be stomping throughout the temples or times where uh anakin skywalker would be doing reckless things and then he would be making you know different types of slights and and derogatory statements towards anakin skywalker because he didn't have the authority he did have the authority but he didn't have the true dominance and leadership skills to be able to correct Anakin Skywalker properly because he lacked the emotional depth and fortitude to do it so Obi-Wan Kenobi would just make you know just make slight remarks and things like that in times where he didn't like Anakin Skywalker's behaviors right so these are just some things that you might notice about Obi-Wan Kenobi and these are things that didn't all the way dissipate. Yes, he grew as a person more as he got older, especially like after Revenge of the Sith, going into A New Hope. But even then, when you're looking at the perspectives of what he was experiencing during the time where Luke Skywalker was getting ready to fight uh, Darth Vader, you know, his perspective was that Luke was going to have to kill Darth Vader. He didn't see another way. Now, you can also look at it like this. You know, that's understandable. But when he gave himself over to the duty to to the cause and sacrifice himself fighting darth vader you could say that he was getting more and more attuned with the feminine submissive aspects which made him masculine and dominant see one thing to understand about masculine dominance is that oftentimes your spirit not all the time not all the time but oftentimes it's not uncommon for your spiritual perspective to be in polarity to your life position right so when we're looking at like Qui-Gon Jinn and I'll have to make a video about him specifically but Qui-Gon Jinn was a masculine dominant right but within being a masculine dominant Qui-Gon Jinn was an individual who 
was very feminine and submissive and attuned to the force to the light side of the force and just the force in general so because of that he wasn't very tied down to the rules and structures of you know uh, of the council right similar to his master count dooku he wasn't very tied down to that and because he wasn't very tied down to that and he was very fine-tuned to the force itself there were actions that he took that on the surface appeared to go against the principles and the beliefs of what was considered acceptable by the Jedi Order, right? So when you understand that, these were things that used to bother Obi-Wan Kenobi. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Qui-Gon Jinn didn't get along that well because, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi was more so a do it by the book type of individual. But the thing about being masculine submissive, it's difficult to do that unless you're in a position where when you are in a leadership position, you have, you know, you, you got to be masculine dominant to be in a leadership position with certain people, right? No, you can be masculine submissive with the individual who's masculine submissive and still be in, in somewhat of a leadership position, but that's more so a partnership role. And when Obi-Wan Kenobi was the master of, of Anakin Skywalker, he was in quote unquote a leadership position, but the role that they played with each other was more so like brothers and friends, right? And when somebody is in a position of wanting to learn and wanting to grow and the person who is in charge of them on paper is not someone who they can respect and look up to, it often leads to resentment if they feel like the individual is holding them back. So Anakin Skywalker often felt like he was more powerful than Obi-Wan Kenobi. But there are some benefits to being masculine and submissive. There are some benefits and I'll break those down. Obi-Wan Kenobi is the quintessential master of Form 3 right form three is sarisu which is the most is the disciplined defense first style uh there are different things that they say just in lore star wars lore about how sarisu works and obi-wan kenobi was you know especially for his power level he was damn near unmatched when it came to his ability with the blade right wasn't the most aggressive but he was very very disciplined and that discipline can keep you on a safe path if you're in the right direction so for obi-wan kenobi he was masculine submissive with the jedi order so as long as the jedi order was somewhat of the right path he would be on the right path but if the jedi order got off of the right path he wouldn't then be on the right path but he still stayed in a safe enough space think about obi-wan kenobi like somebody who goes to church every sunday right they may not be necessarily in tuned with spirituality now some people who go are right that would be like obi-wan i mean that would be like qui-gon jinn but at the same time because he stayed in that environment and his idea was the light side of the force he was still someone who was in tune to some of the principles to the light side of the force although he may not have been as in tune to the force in and of itself as qui-gon jinn was so he was very good with his technical skills he was very good at his diplomacy his lack of natural dominance within his personality made it so that Obi-Wan Kenobi had the ability to be a good communicator. He had the ability to be a very diplomatic individual. So he would always go for surrender versus defeating somebody, right? He would always go for surrender first in most instances because he was always willing to negotiate. And that's one thing about the masculine submissive position is that it's a position of negotiating, right? But look at it like this, you know, you can look at masculine submissiveness and, I, and I'll bring it back into like the conversation about like traditional marriage. Uh, we live in a day and age of a high level of sexual overstimulation and spiritual overstimulation in a lot of ways. There's a lot of spirits that surround us, a lot of things going on, a lot of pervasive thought processes and ideas. Uh, so this is a day and age in which it's not always going to be beneficial to take a masculine submissive stance because there are a lot of people who are seeking to take advantage it's kind of like being a sheep, you know what I mean? And you can be a strong ass sheep. You can be a strong she sheep, but there are also other ways that that can go wrong. One of those ways of, of how that can go wrong is if you are being used by a structure as a tyrant against your knowledge to oppress other people because your beliefs are not rooted enough in what is overall morality in, in a and just what it means to be a good person. You're not in tune enough with thinking for yourself to be able to identify when something is going against what is the necessary thing to do, All right? Another thing about being a masculine submissive is that you mind your business when you get off work. And that's a good thing, right? You don't really take your work home with you, but so much. And 
uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi did, but like, let's say it's the scenario of Anakin Skywalker when it came to Anakin Skywalker uh, being with Padme Amidala. He knew, he knew, but he didn't do or say anything about it because he was like, uh, it's not my business, right? Bro code, right? So what we got to understand about these different aspects of masculine submissiveness is that it's not all bad, but it definitely has its short moments. And I think one of the greatest quotes of what really represents uh, masculine submissiveness is, is this, right? When the righteous lose the light, evil once dead shall return. Now, this is a quote of what Obi-Wan Kenobi read when Qui-Gon Jinn had him studying and doing research and, and translating manuscripts, right? See, he didn't understand what this meant. One thing about masculine submissive is that they often lack a certain level of emotional or mo emotional and spiritual depth. Like if it doesn't make enough sense to them on a surface level, it doesn't make sense. You know, another thing about being masculine submissive is that when you are in the presence of a masculine dominant, being masculine submissive will greatly slow down your progress. Greatly slow down your progress because you're going to be transactional and very uh, put one foot in front of the other and you're approaching your mindset, but you're not going to have the right mindset and outlook and energy to really progress in the ways that you need to be to progress in, especially if a person isn't telling you exactly what it is that they need you to learn, because you may not be learning the things beyond a surface level that you need to learn on your own in order to progress. So masculine submissiveness can definitely stifle you, right? It's just like uh, like when we're looking at the sexual polarity quadrant, like something I always say is that femininity, it corrupts dominance, but masculinity stifles submissiveness. Now, all of these different traits have, have benefits to them. Like the consistency, the discipline that comes with being masculine submissive is pretty high as long as you're getting all the things that you need, right? And uh, you, you also have to think about sexual polarity erosion. I'm not gonna get too deep into sexual polarity erosion on this particular video, but this is a topic that I do wanna talk about and I do wanna break it down. But Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, it's very easy to be a masculine submissive and then to look like a good person or a nice guy on the surface when really beneath the surface you may not be as good of a person as you think you are and you may not be as nice or as good as you think you are you're just doing what you think you got to do you're just doing what you're supposed to do and when it comes to topics that are like uh long-term relationships where sex is involved you know especially if it's not just a fully open relationship or especially circumstances that involve spirituality or circumstances that involved uh, providing for a family and, and making money and circumstances where there are people who are duplicitous in your midst, masculine submissiveness will stifle you, right? It'll stifle you because the mindset that he had, a lot of people like the Jedi Order itself, like uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi was the quintessential Jedi, right? He's the picture perfect Jedi, and he really represented a lot of what the Order was about because he lived his life by the principles of the Jedi Order. So just like everyone else, he wasn't able to identify that, you know, that that uh, that Senator Palpatine was really, you know, was really Darth Sidious. He wasn't able to, to recognize or discern that. You know, oftentimes when you're masculine submissive, you rely so much on what's right in front of you that you're unable to truly have discernment about a lot of things because you're just kind of going off of, you know, playing it by the book. But there were other benefits that came with it. He learned a lot in his time, but just like I, I was saying earlier about how he was a Padawan until he was 17, he was really frustrated about it. He really dedicated himself. There is a certain hubris and pride that is often beneath being masculine submissive that a lot of people won't understand. And that is something that can benefit you, right? It can benefit you. That's what caused him to become such a great sword master, right? Such a great master with the saber. It wasn't just because he just loved sabers. It was because he took pride in his ability to be good at it. He wanted other people to see him and to, to praise him for it. And that's really why he stuck with Sarisu because there was a point in time where Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, wanted to take his mastery of the saber and to learn Vapad, but he wasn't allowed to. It's because they could tell that just Vapad wasn't for him, right? But with his masculine submissiveness, he was able to take his lack of talent and go further with it. 
One thing about being masculine and dominant is that it takes a lot of hard work and or talent. And with when it comes to being feminine submissive, it takes a lot of talent or at least it takes the proper leadership and it takes a lot of wisdom and discernment to be masculine and dominant. So for somebody who doesn't have a lot of talent, you know, oftentimes survival mode, masculine submissiveness is something that could be beneficial. But it just hurts you when you have somebody in your midst who's who's supposed to learn from you, who isn't learning the things they need to learn. His mindset, his philosophy, his his personality, his demeanor is something that limited his ability to be a good teacher and a good master to, to Anakin Skywalker because they were like brothers, right? Just like if you're in a relationship. Something I always say is that premature integration often works like this. Premature integration often works like this when it comes to sexual polarity. If you don't establish yourself as a leader and you don't establish yourself as being respected and you don't establish yourself as being a provider or, or a protector or whatever it is, mostly uh, respect and them desiring your validation to a certain extent early on, then something that can occur, right, is that when you get to a certain place, if respect isn't established on a hierarchical level, then once that relationship is built, built to a certain level, if you then feel the need to speak with authority, it's not going to be very well received. It's not. It's just like if you're a parent and you have a child and you're trying to be friends first with them. And then as they grow older, you know, then, you know, things get serious. They start acting crazy. And then now you're like, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. It's like, no, why are you bringing all these new rules up? Why are you trying to switch it up and act like this wasn't what it was? See, that's kind of what occurred with Obi-Wan and, and Anakin, because Anakin needed a lot further guidance. Like if Qui-Gon Jinn was still alive, he would have been a much better teacher for Anakin Skywalker than Obi-Wan Kenobi was, even though Obi-Wan Kenobi was a very good Jedi on his own in the purpose and the duty that he had. It's just like I said, you know, if the righteous lose the light, then that once was once dead shall return. So this is Coach Brody on Obi-Wan Kenobi, the masculine submissive. I'm out.